Hi, and welcome to Story Kit Talks, where we talk about video, storytelling, social media, and everything in between. My name, as always, is Jonna Ekman, and I'm the marketing director at StoryKit. And with me today, I have the CEO and founder of StoryKit, Peter Bonnier, and of course, um, our community manager, Heidi Bordal, who is checking all the channels that you can send in questions in. And the last couple of episodes, we've gotten a lot of nice questions. So please send them in. They're making everything a lot more fun. And we get a chance to know what you're thinking about. So today, uh, we're going to talk about a subject that is really close to my heart, storytelling. Oh, my God, I can't push the table like that. Um, Storytelling. And I um, I have a background as a journalist, which means that I'm a storyteller by heart. I always try to look for the story and everything. So for me, this comes really, really natural, but it's not a natural thing for everyone. And when I talk about storytelling out there, I often refer to a story where that is, I think it's been written on Quora. Uh, It's an old story about Steve Jobs, where he enters a break room in Silicon Valley and just shouts out, who is the most powerful person in the world? This was in 1994 when he was the CEO of Pixar and he hadn't really done anything good yet. Um, And some person in the room just said, well, I don't know, Nelson Mandela, maybe. Uh, And Steve Jobs is said to have said, no, you're all wrong. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. And he continued, the storyteller sets the vision, values and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. And I love that story because it makes it so obvious that Steve Jobs wasn't a good storyteller to begin with. But he realized that he had to learn and he became one of the most famous storytellers we've ever had. But I also love the story because for me, it's kind of obvious that that story, I don't know if it's made up. I I don't know if, if he actually said those words in that way, but it doesn't really matter because it's a nice story that tells us something. And that's... As a journalist, I can't lie, <laughs> but but I know that telling stories is so much more than saying the actual things that are happening. And that's why I'm happy to have Peter with me today, because I don't think you would refer to yourself as a storyteller, would you? No. <laughs> but still, you're one of the greatest storytellers I know. Uh, <laughs> and like yesterday during lunch, I was like, that story you told me two days ago was it actually true and you were like nah (laughs) (laughs) so I think you you really have it in you uh and that's a thing that um, me and my husband were both old journalists and I've asked him a thousand times would you consider yourself a storyteller and he's like no and I'm like you're you're an old journalist You, you you tell stories as a living uh but very few people consider themselves storytellers. But that is actually too bad because everyone is a storyteller because everyone is like you, having stories to tell like over dinner or... Uh, no, but but uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, we we have this in our company mission, right? We want to yeah. help people in organizations and, and, and companies all over the world tell, tell the best stories they can. And so... Um, I agree with that. That that also, in to an increasing degree, um, when more and more people in an organization need to communicate or are tasked with communication, where they really weren't before, uh, we all, to some extent, have to become storytellers. Then yeah. the question of whether we then identify ourselves as storytellers or not, I think, is maybe less relevant. But but the point is that. Whether we want it or not, we we are I and mean, we become yeah. storytellers. I mean, I think 15 years ago, if you were in my position today, you would not really have to communicate. Whereas externally, I mean, in public, more than the random keynote at a large trade fair or something like that right which probably someone else in your comms team then had written for you uh, both 
the keynote itself uh, and and the and the script. Uh, whereas today, I think it's it's really expected of of any you know any CEO or any um, any manager in an organization to to communicate and tell stories on a regular basis. And so we we've talked about this before, I think in in this pod as well. But but this broadening of the communication task from from a specialized function of people like you to a really general function to people like me i think it's it's the transition you know that that we want to enable so it was really two things right the first thing is we want to enable you or the people people like you to become more productive yeah and uh, and maybe more efficient and, and maybe better uh, at, at what you do as storytellers and then we also want to enable people like me to be able to be efficient storytellers whether we have it Kind of naturally or not, right? So, uh, and 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 I think it's debatable whether it's whether storytelling is kind of a learned or a, an innate trait, and I don't think that's relevant either. But but I do think it's 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 important that that everyone, you know, m- more or less everyone in organizations get the ability and 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 have the potential to to tell stories because because it's really what's expected. Uh, yeah, but why? I mean, this is like we talk so much about storytelling and just saying that it is important. Uh, but you're saying that 15 years ago you wouldn't even have bothered. Yeah. So uh-huh. what has changed, and why do we have to tell stories? Exactly. So so this is um, this is um, I, I I think. I think we've talked about this before here as well, but so I, I'm I'm sorry if I, I repeat myself, but, but this is something that I talk about almost every day. So so I, I can definitely do it again today. Um no, so it's all driven by distribution. Yeah. So where distribution of content or advertising or communication, right? So any kind of messaging coming out of the company or an organization was expensive, very, very expensive, and very um um what's the word here limited in scope 15 years ago you really ha- didn't have a lot of choices right you could try to affect a journalist at a publication that was relevant to you to tell your story for you and that was called pr and there were a bunch of strategies that we used for that you could buy space for your messaging in a publication or tv or at the trade fair or you know, so on and so forth, or you could custom publish. You could create your own publishing entity, magazine, or um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the DM print thing that you sent out, or whatever. And you could tell your story that way. And all of those last three were were very costly, and it was very, very important that the messaging itself was um, um, perfectly crafted. Uh, because you couldn't afford to waste whatever money you spent on that distribution. So printing your own magazine or sending a direct mailing or buying a huge booth and a speaking slot at an expensive um, fair or event, these things cost a lot of money. So once you got there, it was really important that what you presented was perfect. And so it was also really important that specialists kind of crafted and produced that message. It also dro- drove the entire process around doing that. So all the planning and focus grouping and trend reporting and secret shopping and you know like all of the things that we did in marketing. Um, but then distribution changed. So distribution became democratized in a way where anyone really could publish. And this is driven obviously then by first by the web and then by social media. And where everyone can publish and uh, when social media came along, m- anyone could also get noticed if the message was good enough because distribution was really linked to the quality of your story. So if you told something really interesting and relevant and that touched kind of the nerve of your audience, they would start sharing and interacting with it. And then the, the platform itself would start spreading this message. And that was true for paid as well. So when you put budgets behind that if you wanted to buy distribution you got a lot more distribution if your messaging was really good and your story was was resonating with the audience um 
and 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 so this the, the, so, so suddenly anyone could do it but also mm-hmm. the demands on production shifted so to do that you needed to do it often all the time across all of these channels and that's very hard to do for a limited specialized function like a, like an agency in-house agency or a single communicator in a single organization or something like that so you kind of you needed to spread that task across the organization and when that started happening that also became the norm and the expectation so the audience started thinking wow this is really weird that this person has never published to you know to social media x like why are they why aren't they telling their story um and it became super important i mean from a from a management perspective this goes for so for every role has this like this change has happened in every role in a slightly different way but from from a management perspective i think that the probably the most important point is employer branding right so it's yeah. it's how transparent how open how knowledgeable how you know uh, humble how whatever traits you're looking for in your organization you start looking to leadership and saying how do they act in these different channels and you know we see a ton of really great examples of that and we see a ton of really um uh, uh not great examples of that at the moment so it's interesting but but um but yeah i think that's what changed so distribution is kind of driven or distribution i.e. media consumption has kind of driven all of the these these changes that that I think can kind of I try to remember what the question was here, but that, <laughs> what? That, that that kind of goes back to this idea of why of storytelling every, is important. Everyone yeah. having to be a storyteller. Yeah. And so yeah. then why the format? So I don't, you know, I now we, let's let's let me let me before you get yeah, into that. Yeah, yeah. Um because I think this is interesting because I see that like social distribution has driven a lot of change here and all of that. But I also see storytelling just going into everything. Uh, right now we have Andy Rasking doing strategic narratives for companies. Like your even your strategy has to be a story. Um, I was struggling with budgets recently and a friend of mine has said like, you're a storyteller, that should be easy for you because doing a budget is telling a story, but with numbers. And, and I think that storytelling is just creeping into everything we do because it's the best way also to convince people and this is where I think that you <laughs> are maybe a better storyteller than you think you are. Would you agree? Or yeah, so I think that you know we we tend to apply a very broad definition here to storytelling, um, yeah. and and from that perspective, you know, I guess you could say that an ad a, a like 30 second tvc in the early 90s was also a story right I, and so i it think probably was yeah well it depends on your kind of definition of the narrative here but but yeah but but, but i guess uh and so for, from from that perspective i think you know i think storytelling if you apply that to all definition i think storytelling has always been important i, I really don't think there's a big change here yeah. in the last years or 10 years or 15 years or 50 years it's, it's always been crucial to kind of the success of an organization or around uh i think what has changed is kind of the nature of how those stories are are told mm. i i tend to talk about i, I don't think this i don't know if this is a good kind of definition it's, it's always hard to like, draw the lines here but I tend to talk about advertising versus versus content essentially, like yeah. so those two different things. So and 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 I don't I honestly don't know if that makes sense. So I, I think lines may be very blurred here. But I I do think what changed with social and especially with the feeds was this idea of forced exposure. So yeah, with print or TV, we uh, as marketers, we uh, assumed forced exposure. So what what you assumed was that someone would be would be exposed to your ad whether they chose to or not because you put it in a place where they wanted to be. I, you know, today I guess the most 
the, the most extreme example of this would be a, an ad at the cinema, right? So you come to the yeah. cinema, you sit down in the theater, it goes on, like it, you don't really have a choice. Like you're going to be exposed to this thing. Uh, it, it, with TV, it obviously wasn't true because people would do a lot of other things during commercial breaks. But 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 the assumption when you produced the creative, when you did the ad, was that someone would be exposed to it, right? Mm. That that was kind of the assumption. That assumption disappeared with social right? yeah. or with the feed because the consumer the, themselves in the content with their little thumb, and it's really not even a very big movement, right? This is like micro movement of your thumb chose whether they would want to be exposed to what you uh, displayed for them or not. And I think that started to change the narrative design or like the, um, uh, I don't even know if I use that term correctly, but that, that started to change the the way that we crafted these messages. Yeah, And, and I think that, that it premiered, that's not the right word, it gave advantage to mm. more traditional say journalistic storytelling or uh, uh, or narrative storytelling so the idea that it's actually a story with some sort of beginning middle end type structure then it it gave advantage to that over these more price product or abstract branding or these more abstract type of messages uh, because people instantaneously recognize those as ads, right? So you kind of go to a place in your mind of forced exposure immediately. Yeah. Whereas with some sort of narrative design, it's much more native to the platform because it's much more similar to what your best friends do or the news brand that you're following or the magazine that you love. You know, it's much more, it, it looks much more like that. And I don't mean looks in 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 the design perspective here, but in, in the way that the stories are told. And so I, I think that started to change maybe 10 years ago. And I think it's it's increasingly changing. So so I think that's also why this discussion about storytelling, because people don't apply this very broad definition that we tend to do. I think that's why why the discussion of storytelling becoming more important in a way. I think that that's why that discussion is so alive because people are recognizing that you can't like plan out the campaign in the same way that you did 15 years ago because what comes out in the end, the, the ad unit, the creative unit has a much more narrative structure to it. And it would be interesting to see, I, I don't know this, right? So, but it would be interesting to see if this has kind of changed the power dynamics between the marketing and the communication lines in the large organization where communi the communication, the PR content kind of comms lines have traditionally applied this type of narrative design, whereas the marketing kind of lines have applied a much more ad-based narrative design. If we, you know, like I'm making up all of these words as I go on. I think you're understanding okay. what I'm trying all... to, to get to, but, but, and it's interesting to see, you know, what we saw, what we see, what I think, what I've kind of anecdotal identified in the last 10 years is that these two lines have merged together much more and become much more integrated. Uh, but it's also interesting to see, you know, how the power dynamics there shift. I honestly don't know. Maybe someone in the audience knows this better. It'd be interesting to hear. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to move on to the... Um... Because what we're trying to do at, at StoryKit and, and what we're trying to help people with is we know that people aren't always great storytellers by heart. They're, they don't always know which stories to tell and they definitely don't always know how to tell them and how to tell them to get the effect that they want. And I mean, I don't always know how to tell the story to get the effect that I want. I have to try, but we have a lot of, we meet a lot of people who doesn't even know where to start. So what we're trying to solve is the how to make people better storytellers. And one of the ways we're always talking about is structuring your story. This is where we 
well, we're touching upon the narrative design word. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's a thing, but but really like structuring your story. And this this isn't new either, because I mean. Aristotle once said that every story needs a beginning, a middle, and the end, and an end. But I mean, but even trying to get people to understand that they need to structure their story for a short video or a short thing on social is quite new for people. Yeah. The sun just came in. Okay. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Uh, so, so could you tell? Could you talk a little bit about that? How we're yeah. Yeah, this this now we are recruiting ourselves because I talked a little bit about this last time, and I know you talked to Frederick about it as well. But but it's important, and I I think a, a big focus for us. Um, yeah, and, and a place I think where digital has really made things way more difficult for people. Yeah. So with 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 t- with TV or or print, there were all of these limitations that forced you into narrative design, if you will. It forced you into formatting. Uh, you had time limitations on TV, which were kind of second-based, and you had to make like decisions that fit this kind of time frame. Uh, in print, you obviously had the size of the page and the quality of the paper, and the length of the magazine, like all of these things. And in digital, all of those things kind of went out the door, and suddenly I think a lot of us thought that maybe we don't have to have structure here. We can... We can reinvent the wheel every time, but when you do, it makes a lot of things harder, right? So it makes the creative process harder with the way you said it. Maybe we're not good enough to just like have an empty canvas every time we start a new story. Um, But even if we are, it's hard to just start with an empty canvas. It's just always easier to start with some sort of precondition or or structure. it also helps productivity immensely if you know what you're talking about. We're going to do one more X is much easier than saying we're going to do something around X, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then it, it also makes, I guess, testing and, and iteration and, um, and, and, and just understanding how the piece performs much better because you, you're not doing every new story is not the new singular thing. It's something that can be compared with other stories of a uh, similar nature, and that that can makes your optimization process much easier. Uh, so yeah, we're huge fans of, of formats. Uh, what, what are your what are, what are your favorite content? Do you have a favorite specific content format? No, I'm actually quite bad at following them since I have been telling stories for so long. But when I start to backtrack my things that I have done, I I. Yeah. I see that I have done it without thinking about it, but I can give you the names of them. Okay, but I, I'll give you a few. Do you want a few from me? Yeah, I want a few from you. Yeah, you'll recognize all of these, I think. W- one of my favorite uh, content formats is, is a format called Kropp I, I don't know if anyone in the... <laughs> oh, you mean like that? Uh, okay. Um, uh, uh, so I misunderstood you. But can I talk about Kropp and Knopp? Knop, knop talk knop. about Kropp and Knopp. Okay, so Kropp and Knopp is uh, a content format that uh, is in a Swedish youth magazine or children's magazine called Kamrat Posten. Mm. Kamrat Posten is this, like slightly educational product for tweens. Is, is that a good expression? And it's been around for like a hundred years. Like, yeah. it's, it's really, it's really, it's been around forever. And ever since I was like nine years old, they've had this format, which is usually a, a full uh, spread. Uh, and it's called Krop and Knop. It's like uh, the reader, the readers send in questions about the crop, the body, and the knop, the head. Like so, like I have an issue with love, or I uh, have a puberty question, uh, or you know, like. And I'm sure uh, I don't know how many of these questions every time are actually sent in by readers, but I, but I, I used to work with this product and and then there were way more questions than could fit the magazine. It, it, it's like such an excellent, instantaneously recognizable, super relevant format. It just comes back time after time after time. Mm. After time. I, I love that. And my other, daughter loves that. Sorry, yeah. My daughter yeah, loves yeah, that. My kids love that as well. And I used to love it. And I love that it's still there. And I love that it's so recognizable. And they've made all of these collections now and books around like with, you know, decades of cropping knops. I love that content format. Uh, another content format that I love 
is a format that, that comes in tabloids, I think, all over the world all the time. Called in Sweden, it was always called V Fem. Yeah, V Fem, uh, which is like a story. You take like a, a relevant now issue, and then you ask five people on the street, and so the, it's like this really sh- short Q and A format. It's one question and one answer. And I used to produce these at one point. Like I'm not a journalist, but I spent one summer interning at the tabloid. So I used to get to do the VFAMs. And it's like, the, it, 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 I love them for two reasons. A, it's like really always good questions and really recognizable. And it's totally random sample, right? I mean, it, it's totally anecdotal. It has nothing to do with statistics, but it's just the people you manage to like get a hold of outside of the editorial room. Yeah, but, also but like, one sub- celebrity. Yeah, often but that came later. It was like a pimp to be fam was when you okay. also got one celebrity. Uh, but usually it used to be just people on the street. Uh, and it was also production efficiency why it's so great because you know someone would ask you like go out and do 15 V Fem. So you would have to have questions that were like relevant to now, but not not daily, like not not so relevant that when they actually got published 10 days later, they would be gone. But I always still read whenever I get read the print magazine, I always read the V Fem. I love that. Uh, uh, can I give one more? And then, yeah, then I, do. I will ask you. Okay, <laughs> no. so I, and I might have said this before, but on the weekends in the Financial Times, there's a there's a uh, there's a, a, a one of the parts. I don't know the word for my newspaper parts in English, but one of the parts is called Lunch with the FT. Yeah, and they have, so they have. I, I might have talked about this before. They have like a, a caricature drawing of the people, the person they have lunch with. Always like a super hyper, like interesting person maybe cultural, maybe politics, maybe come from like different facets of the world. And then they have lunch and like they talk about the person. It's kind of a bio thing, what they've done, but it's also an interview. And it's also about the lunch. It's like, how does it taste? What are they drinking? How much does it cost? They always like, they always put the menu in there, what they ordered and the bill, like how much did it cost? And then it's like interesting. Some people like want to go out and have a burger and a Coke and others go to like the most fancy restaurant and have like a 10 course meal. I, I don't know. It's such a, it's such a like, because of the people they choose, it's really exhaustive as well. It's like a full big thing, right? It takes a while yeah. to read. It's such a good format because if it was just any random interview it had no context if it was just a bio why would they do this person it's always not a very like here now type individual but they because they frame it with this lunch idea suddenly they can like pick anyone who's like yeah. an interesting individual and they can do it it's almost like the summer problems okay that's another mm-hmm. format that i won't talk about that now. okay sorry do, so now do you have any favorite formats <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I, lo- I love uh, I love Sunda's interview, and I think I mentioned yeah. that with Frederick last time. Um, um, and uh, I, there are a lot of interview formats I love, and um, especially the ones that add these types of, I mean, uninteresting things that, like the lunch menu you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. I just need to say because I saw I happened to open the chat and I saw that someone asked me if I had said that as a journalist I can lie uh, and I just need to say no I didn't say that as a journalist I can't lie because uh, everything else would be very as a CEO it's totally fine yeah, no, as, as the CEO <laughs> telling like stories on lunch hour he can he can he can do some I don't some... lie I just Spice it up, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, just so we're totally clear with that. As a journalist, I can't lie. We've got some more interesting questions in the chat. Do you want to join us, Heidi? Yes, please. Uh, the first one is from Michael. He's asking, Hi, Michael. Can you speak a little to the importance and approach channels of storytelling related to the launch of a new tech startup? with a broad customer audience from Gen Z, 18 to 24 year olds, up to established and experienced HR directors, 30 to 40 plus years old. Are different stories needed for different user groups or is one cohesive story work better? Thank you. Well, I I can start answering that at least because that's a bit 
what I have been doing the last latest couple of years, launching to a broad customer audience for a tech startup. And I would recommend starting to find that or those cohesive stories that you really feel is your story and it's the subjects that we know, it's the thing that we can talk about in our sleep and just try to hone them for quite a long time and talk about them over and over again for quite a long time. And then you will start to see that there are different audience that reacts to these stories in different ways and you can start doing that. But I, I'm a big fan of like doing different stories for different audiences and different platforms and different occasions. But I don't think that you can start there because you get to know your story um, and your narrative first to be able to break it up into smaller pieces. Would you agree with it, Peter? I hope you do. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think what we've seen a lot um, in, in this company and, and in previous companies as well is that the, the uh, content is really good at self-selection, self-selecting. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it doesn't mean that you should not have the audience in mind when you create content. I, I, I think you you should, but if well, you of tell, course, but if you tell authentic stories in a way that's kind of inside out, if you will. And if the storytelling is good, it's going to find the, the right audience. That, 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 that's generally what we think. Then I think if I were to start differentiating, so if my, like, if, if, say that we have, let's take an example here. What was this HR? I, I can't remember that Michael's subject. Uh, yeah. I Established, HR. Ex- experienced HR di- directors. So let's let's say that we have we're an HR startup and we're doing um, we're doing uh, some sort of um, um, ATS system, and our passion is um, giving employees the or potential recruits the best. Uh, uh, recruiting experience of their life right it, whether they're hired or not like we're we we provide this super smooth easy fantastic way for people to apply for jobs and get accepted or rejected and and we really like we're really passionate about this idea of, of recruits having an incredible experience because the uh, job market is moving from kind of an, an employer per powered market to an employee power market or something um, and, and we start talking about that, and eventually we want to start differentiating. We want to say, okay, so we, we're telling these stories, and we want to start. With, there's one dimension we want to differentiate on. I wouldn't start with 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 differentiating on different audiences. So I would start thinking about differentiating on either channels. So we have to tell the story differently on YouTube from the way we tell it on like Instagram, right? So. So that has you have to have different aspect ratios and lengths, and you have different time, of course, exposure versus, versus not. That will change your narrative design. So that's one way of differentiating that I think is probably more important than thinking about like this fifty-year-old versus twenty-year-old. And the other one is language. So what we find is that telling stories in local languages yeah. is way, way, way more predictive and important than anything else. Right. So if you just have the resources to differentiate on one thing, I would start differentiating there and mm-hmm. not like doing one version for the more experienced and one more version for the younger. Um, so, so I don't know if that was a, a an inspiring answer, but it's the pragmatic one that I would think about. Yeah, with that being said, we've seen a lot of our users are having huge successes with repurposing their content for different audiences using different images using just a different start using different so so in the end you need to do both but i mean yeah or all three or i mean you can version us on that there 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 and you know I, i think there's a very important premise in the question which is should you repurpose? I think that's yeah. a podcast of its own, which yeah. is probably which is like yes, and what are the ways in which you should repurpose? But 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 so, so that premise is correct. I just don't I just don't think the audience parameter is where I would start. No, we had another question. I think Heidi, we do. This one is from Rick. 
Well, Rick, and, hi. You know, yeah. Rick has been with us before, so super happy to see you joining us again. Um, he asks, how do you tell a story in a 10 or even five second video ad with structure with a beginning, a middle and an end? Well, that's a really good question. And we actually, I think yesterday sent out uh, a newsletter with a link to an article where we have compiled a couple of like great copyright structures, which I think is good for the shortest of formats. Um, just I just reached out for one example here because I don't know these by heart, but one is the BAB, before, after bridge. So start with describing your current world and its problems. For we, For us, it would be like, Everyone needs to tell stories, but not everyone is a storyteller. Describe the second step is describe what your world would look like if the problem was solved. What if everyone could tell as many stories as they wanted in with the resources they have and the and so forth? And then the bridge is this is how you get it, they get there. And for us, it would be story kit it. So, so that's a really effective way to use this copywriting techniques to actually get that structure for your super short ad um but when it comes to longer storytelling arcs we are working very very we're working structured to to find those and we've been doing that for ages so thank you rick for that question and i hope that was a was an answer that you liked and find that article if you didn't get that news letter it's it's uh, at our blog at storykit.io. But it makes me think about, we've been working with trying to find the best storytelling structures since we started seven years ago as a completely different company. And one of my favorite examples was that when we started creating videos, this was when we were doing editorial stuff. Uh, we started doing listicles because everyone was doing listicles. And we saw them... We, we really saw a good engagement with them, but we started thinking like, how could we make these even more engaging and how can we make the audience stay a little longer? And someone was smart enough to just say, let's try to change the numbers instead of counting from one to five, count from five to one. And it changed the retention really a lot. We did the same thing with, we, we had a huge success with, um, recipe and cooking videos uh and we we started out with make creating videos where we gave out the whole recipe in the start and then people stopped looking at the video so if we could spread that recipe out throughout the video we got a much better retention curve so we've been trying to find these ways to tell stories to e to actually make people stay for a lot of years now and and now we're trying to add that in our like in our own, uh, yeah, well, in our own product. Yeah, so stay tuned. I think that, <laughs> that's the hook, right? I, stay I, I tuned. Think, I think the idea is that we, we've spent a lot of time and effort and uh, looked at hundreds of millions of video views on social for the last seven years. And I, I think we, we've kind of, we have an idea of, yep. of, of things that work. And, um, and, 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 Already today, as you like you said, I haven't actually seen that logo. I need to look at it. But th there are tips and tricks all throughout our resources. But but uh, but we also have a, a, a way higher ambition in um, in doing this. I also think I'll, I'll say one last thing about video formats. Uh, or I don't know if it's the last, one last you, thing. You might have very a lot of other questions, but. I think formatting also makes translation from other content formats much easier. So one of the things that I often struggle with is I have something. I have yeah. a recruitment ad or a blog post or a something which has a narrative format that works really well for that. So recruitment ad is great, right? Because I, I do this a lot. Uh, it's like recruitment ads have a very like, generally accepted format right that people that look for jobs want in the recruitment app they wanted to list something first and then you know and, and sometimes people play around with that but more or less it's basically the same format it's not great to just take that and put it into a video right? that doesn't really become very good 
But so if you've built a similar format already for video, that translation also becomes much easier. So it's not only like helping you start from scratch, it also helps you a lot in like bringing something from one place into video. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was maybe. No, it's um, not what you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to say anything special. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's totally true. Um, I, I think that's totally true and something we see people struggle with a lot because we talk a lot about repurposing, but how do you actually do that? How do you condense a long blog post into a 30-second ad uh, um, video? That's like Rick's question. So how do you tell this story in 10 or 5 or 30 seconds? I mean, it's 10,000 words. Yeah. Uh, so that's really what we're trying to help them with. Um, I do have one last question for you uh, or for myself. I don't really know yet. Um, mm. So, I mean, using narrative design or formats or storytelling structure, or whatever you want to call them, is good because it makes your storytelling better but what are the benefits of telling better stories so what are what's the roi here yeah so i mean and i think i touched on this very early mm -hmm. the basic premise of this for social which is where this this feedback loop is the is the best it's true for us for other places as well, it's just not as evident as for social, mm. is that you'll get more distribution. Yeah. So, so better content will lead to more people seeing that content because if you can resonate with the messaging, you are much more likely to view it to the end or to engage with it. And as I, as I said, and, and that, that, that will put it in front of more people, but it will also obviously make them... Um, um, make them more susceptible to accepting the messaging or understanding the messaging. And that was true for other media as well, like better ads perform better. It just didn't have this link to distribution that social does. And so we have this almost double effect on social where the ad works better or the communicative messaging works better and it also yields more distribution. Yeah. So what you're saying is better results. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. So the other things that I see are really like the benefits of using a, a structure and not just doing everything from scratch every time. Is as we've talked about a lot earlier. It's 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 helping your productivity because you don't need you get you can get a you can hit the round the hit the ground running and get a head start. So that's one of the things. But also it's really good for testing and content optimization yeah. because if you don't know what you've done, <laughs> how can you know what wasn't working? Or, and how can you test something else if you don't know what that first thing was? Exactly. Um, That's what I talked about earlier. If you have two, two of the same or three of the same or 15 of the same or similar, it just makes iteration much easier, right? Yeah. Do we need to change the format? Uh, or w when when within the specific format do we get resonance or do we get someone to actually understand or, or, or resonate with the content? So, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Ah, I think we're done for today. What do you think? Do you, I can't see any more questions in the chat. Have you seen something, Heidi? I haven't. Just uh, replies of uh, thank yous. Ah. That's so nice. I want to thank all of you who's been with us for 45 minutes talking about storytelling and structure. And we'll be back in two weeks. And then I have actually invited uh, an external guest, not just us story kitters. Uh, so we're going to be talking to Lin Kwai, who is the C C Chief Brand Officer at OneFlow about branding, which will be a lot of fun. So please join us then and find us at StoryKit.io and read that blog post that I was talking about with the copywriting techniques because it's really fun. Um, see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Bye-bye. Yeah, hi.